Uh, can I acknowledge the presence of many, a number of members of the board of the Ramsey Centre? Uh, Henry Ergas, our um, distinguished speaker tonight, is what I would call a modern public intellectual. He's a person who's had <clears throat> a remarkably pre-journalistic career uh, as um, a distinguished economist, as somebody who's um, presided over the OECD Infrastructure Task Force. And if you're worried about uh, the future uh, in um, a globalised world, infrastructure seems to be part of that. Henry, of course, is now based in New York. And uh, his wife is Gillian Bird, a very distinguished officer of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, who is our country's permanent representative at the United Nations. And I've not only been properly advised and instructed by Henry's journalistic offerings, but I've also been, over the years, properly advised and instructed, perhaps I didn't always follow it, by Gillian as a senior member of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I think it's pretty remarkable David Frost thought he was very clever regularly commuting between New York and London uh, when he had that celebrated This Day Tonight program. Uh, well, this was the week that was rather program on the BBC, but also fulfilling engagements in the United States. But Henry, of course, uh, maintains a regular commute between New York and Australia. And those of us who've done that uh, travel on a number of occasions know that it is about four times uh, the distance that um, the um, uh, eminent David Frost had to do. But Henry's writings in The Australian would be familiar to so many people in this audience, perhaps not so familiar as being his remarkable uh, academic career, his association with universities in Great Britain, in France, and of course in Australia. And we are delighted uh, that he is our distinguished speaker tonight on a topic that will, I think, enthrall all of the audience, so I invite him to address you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Howard. And thank you to the Ramsey Centre for inviting me and thank all of you for being here. Uh, early in the winter of 1950, as the Cold War threatened to turn hot, Joseph and Stuart Alsop, sat down to do something they had never done before. Although still young, the Alsop brothers had already cemented their position among the United States' leading newspaper columnists. Consummate Washington insiders, related by marriage to the Roosevelts, hosts of the city's most important dinner parties at a time when America's power and prestige were at their absolute peak they seemed to have little to fear. Yet, what they were proposing, Stuart wrote to a close friend, had my palms visibly sweating. They were proposing to accuse Lewis Johnson, Harry Truman's Secretary of Defense, of lying. The reaction was thunderous. No matter how compelling the brothers' case against Johnson may have been, the New York Herald Tribune their main employer, could not bring itself to use the word lie. Papers to which the column was syndicated refused to run it, with some editors reminding the brothers of the press's absolute responsibility to uphold the country's institutions, respect its most senior officials, and be measured in tone and outlook. It was a lesson the Alsop brothers, who their biographer rightly calls the guardians of the American century would never forget. All that seems light years away. Even before Donald Trump had entered the White House, the Washington Post began to refer to his claims as lies. The New York Times followed suit a few months later. The election, the New York Times' executive editor, Dean Basquiat, said in October 2016, quote, forced us to get comfortable with saying something is false. In doing so, it changed journalism. 
burying to the acclamation of some and the condemnation of others what little remained of the ethic of self-effacement which had characterized the Alsop era. The change comes on top of many others. Already weakened by the rise of broadcasting, newspapers have been hammered by the internet, which has fragmented the media environment into millions of pieces, while forcing newspapers to compete with every form of content for consumer scarce and often fickle attention. At the same time, the advertising revenues on which newspapers relied for a high and until then rising share of their incomes have shrunk as more effective advertising channels emerge, both in the form of competing content providers and of platforms such as Google, Facebook, and Twitter. Forced by intensified competition for advertising to ramp up their subscriber numbers if they are to survive, many newspapers are being driven to be more partisan and strident, reaching out above the din of the internet to those readers who have strong views and are willing to pay to see them confirmed. As for the columnists, their position is perhaps even worse. Time-starved consumers, their opinions already largely fixed, have little tolerance for subtleties. They may eat salad at lunch, but for commentary they demand red meat, delivered quickly, preferably with the blood dripping. <laughs> Adding to the pressures, consumers are no longer merely passive readers. Rather, whatever columnists write is promptly put through the grinder by online mobs whose default mode is frequently the insult and whose default style is frequently the tirade. And with editors desperate for snippets that could go viral, everything is pushing commentary to be even more polarized than the paper as a whole, unleashing a race in which columnists and commentators try to be heard by turning up the volume. That picture that I have just painted is, of course, a vast simplification of a reality that is complex, full of exceptions, and affected by counter tendencies. Yet it captures the terms in which our predicament presents itself. Can intelligent commentary, which is willing to clearly stake its ground, but does so by appealing to reason rather than to instinct, survive in an age of anger? And even if it can, is it destined to play any useful role? There are no sure or simple answers to those questions. But what may be helpful is to place the issues into the perspective of how we got to where we are. In his Outlines of the Philosophy of Right, Hegel said, I believe correctly, that philosophy is our time apprehended in concepts. What he meant is that when they think historically, people are giving and asking for reasons in more bloodless and dispassionate terms than is the case in historical or lived reality. We try, in looking at the past and thereby understanding the present, to comprehend our subjectivity, why things present themselves to us as they do. Human history is littered with setbacks and even horrors, but there always remains the need for self-comprehension, which picks up the pieces and sets out anew. In setting off on that journey, it seems reasonable to adopt the narrative pattern so aptly recommended to the White Rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. Begin at the beginning, the king said gravely, and go on till you come to the end. Then stop. And that is precisely what I intend to do. As far as beginnings are concerned, suffice it to say, that while printing spread enormously rapidly in Europe after Gutenberg invented his movable type pre printing press in 1450, the first periodic English news sheets did not appear until the early 1620s. It then took another 50 years after that for the term newspaper to enter the English language. And it was only in the first two decades of the 18th century that the terms journalist, 
and editor were coined. Nonetheless, by the time those terms had become part of the English vocabulary, it was clear that the rise of the print media was a part of a much broader reshaping of Western society. The word newspaper itself hints at the change. After all, the essence of modernity is the conviction that the present is unlike the past and that the future will differ from the present. The very idea that there is always news, something novel and important in the universe, was new. Yes, it was obvious to the medieval mind that things happened, but those events were disturbances, such as wars, plagues, natural disasters, against the backdrop of a fixed reality. The notion that reality itself was constantly changing as a result of purpose of human action marked the rise of a radically new world view. Every bit as important was the evolving context in which this worldview took hold. It is well known that during the 17th and 18th centuries, European societies underwent a process of functional specialization. What we mean by that is that under feudalism, political, economic, and social life were essentially merged. In the transition to the modern world, each of these became a separate domain. Political functions, the activity of ruling, became the duty of specialized structures, which today we call governments or the state. Economic activity moved out of the home into markets, which were rapidly growing, and a secular social sphere emerged, taking forms that went from formal structures, such as lodges and fraternities, to informal meeting places, such as coffee houses, reading rooms, and salons. A crucial interaction occurred between the social sphere and the political domain. The idea that rulership rests on some form of consent had and has a very long history. For example, in Behemoth, which he wrote in 1668, Hobbes articulated the principle that, quote, the power of the mighty hath no foundation but in the opinion and belief of the people, unquote. And although Behemoth remained unpublished during Hobbes's lifetime, the relation of rule to consent was clearly expressed by Locke and given a foundation in human reason by Montesquieu, only gathering strength after that. The process by which that strength became overwhelming was complex and protracted. What matters here is that the development of a social sphere distinct from church and state implied that there was now an actor, a social subject, which was the source of the consent whose foundational role Locke and others asserted. That actor was the public, which expressed itself through what came to be known as opinion, a term which, like the Greek word doxa, referred to beliefs that rather than having the certainty that comes from statements of fact or logical inferences involve an element of human judgment. Moreover, deliberation, the process of arriving at and testing opinion in the light of reason, was what gave those judgments some type of legitimacy or validation as truth. Finally, and crucially for our purpose, deliberation was viewed as inherently public, with the print media both underpinning the process and reflecting its outcome. It is therefore in this period that Rousseau, in his discourse on the arts and sciences in 1750, coined the term public opinion. In England, a similar term, general opinion, had developed slightly before then, but public opinion replaced it in the 1780s. The physiocrats had used the term in France, enlightened opinion, to mean an opinion purified through critical discussion in the public sphere to constitute a true opinion. Thus, a clear link was established between the formation of opinion, critical public commentary, and truth, with a whole presupposing and resting upon some underlying communicative process. As that link was being formed, 
Another important notion was gaining ground, that of civility. One can, somewhat unusually, identify a precise time and place for the arrival of this term in its modern meaning. The publication of Erasmus's De Civilitate Morum Puerilam on civility in children, which appeared in 1530, and which, by the standards of its age, became an extraordinary bestseller, going through 130 editions over the next two centuries. Erasmus's text, which makes great reading, is almost entirely concerned with outwardly behavior. How to present in public, a term which itself had come to mean something along the lines of in the presence of others, and more broadly, how to relate to other people. Those were vital questions, as the rise of cities and the growth of commerce meant entering into relations with strangers in dealings which were governed neither by hierarchical nor by familial codes of conduct. The answer as to how those relations should operate lay partly in new standards of etiquette, but it mainly involved cultivating from earliest childhood an incessant form of self-control that became known as civility, that instead of the warrior instincts or ethic of honor and fealty, took stability, predictability, and the taming of passions as its core virtues. Civility was, in that sense, an indispensable ingredient in rational deliberation. Without the calm, informed, and considered exchange of views, arguments degenerated into quarrels, and quarrels into violence. And it also became the expected standard for discussions in print, with those who deviated from that standard being roundly criticized. All this ascribed a lofty role to the rather primitive ancestors of today's mastheads, who were to be the bearers and recorders of the process of rational will formation. And no one expressed that role in loftier terms than Immanuel Kant. The Kantian conception is as complex, as you would expect, as it is brilliant. Reduced to a handful of propositions, it stated that ultimately the legitimacy of state action can only rest on morality. Morality, in turn, can only be known through reason. Reason's proper exercise presupposes communication, for, as Kant put it in the Critique of Pure Reason, the touchstone whereby we decide whether our holding a thing to be true is conviction or mere persuasion is the possibility of communicating it and finding it to be valid for all human reason. As a result, he went on to say, the public use of one's reason must always be free, and it alone can bring enlightenment among men. To be legitimate, the sovereign's decisions therefore had to be public and open to scrutiny. This is Kant's famous principle of publicity. But for that public scrutiny to confirm those decisions' legitimacy, the public needed the ability, underpinned by the freedom to speak and write, to debate their merits in the light of reason. Informing that debate was the task of the print media. In many respects, our ideal of the press's role has not changed since Kant's formulation. Seen in terms of public purpose, Newspapers should help citizens understand the world they live in, grasp its ever-changing realities, scrutinize public action, explain, clarify, and test competing points of view, and in all those ways, support civil discussion. Our conception of what the print media do, therefore dates back, or should do, therefore dates back to the 1700s. But our notion of how papers actually do it only emerged in the closing years of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century. The driving force was a dramatic change in the newspaper industry's economics. 
Until the late 1800s, there were few economies of scale in the production of newspapers. The costs involved in setting up a newspaper were low, as were the fixed costs of ongoing supply relative to the variable costs of paper printing and distribution. As a result, throughout the 19th century, larger circulation papers could coexist with a multitude of smaller papers, generating intense competitive pressures and low newspaper prices in those countries which permitted open entry. With commercial advertising still in its infancy, the financial viability of many papers, indeed virtually all papers, depended on subsidies from current or aspiring office holders, leading to a press that was intensely and unashamedly partisan. Beginning in the late 1870s, almost every aspect of that picture was transformed. The development of very high-speed printing presses brought enormous advances in the printing process. The maximum daily printing capacity of a press increased 16-fold, 16 16-fold, 16 between 1874 and 1895, before trebling again in the next seven years. In 1870, the largest press in the world made 17,000 impressions per hour. Barely 30 years later, it made well over a million. At the same time, a slew of technical improvements reduced the cost of newsprint by about two-thirds and made it efficient to purchase newsprint in extremely large lots. From being artisanal, the production of newspapers became industrial and highly capital intensive, with large circulation papers having much lower unit costs than their smaller rivals. No less importantly, advertising markets were also transformed in that period. Two factors interacted. On the one hand, urbanization, income growth, and rising literacy laid the foundations for a mass consumer base. On the other, consumer good industries, such as soaps, processed foods, tobacco products, and household fittings, themselves became marked by high capital intensity and vast economies of scale making them capable of supplying standardized products in huge quantities at highly affordable prices. Bringing the two together, connecting consumer good firms seeking sales with consumers seeking inexpensive, reasonable quality goods, was the development of systematic marketing, which gave birth to national brands that ranged from Singer Sewing Machines to Colgate, Kellogg, and Nestle. Most importantly for the newspaper industry, the rise of national brands created a rapidly expanding market for display advertising, which hadn't existed until then, in which large circulation papers had enormous advantages. The most obvious result was a spectacular increase in concentration levels as some newspapers expanded to take advantage of the economies of scales and other can came to control the local market and others collapsed. In the United States, for example, while the number of newspapers continued to grow, the number of cities with two or more daily papers declined by two-thirds in the interwar years. By 1940, for every city which had two daily papers or more, there were nine which had only one. But underpinning that rise in concentration and the rise to power of the legendary media barons, was intense competition to be the top paper. With the subscription prices for American newspapers adjusted for inflation falling by two thirds from the 1890s to the 1920s. Yet prices were only one element of the race for scale and perhaps not the most significant. Rather, what also changed was the entire ethos of the newspaper. While signs of change can be seen in the pioneering French daily Le Matin, which was founded in 1884, the great innovator was Adolf Hochs, who in 1896 purchased the New York Times at a bargain basement price as it teetered on the brink of bankruptcy. Hochs realized that the vast investments required in high-speed 
printing equipment and in physical distribution could only be viable if the paper attracted massive advertising revenues, which was only possible if it had equally massive readership. And he also realized that the paper would never secure that readership if it remained narrowly partisan. He therefore set down two slogans, which still grace the masthead to this day, which its editors were to take as imperative guidance, that the paper would give the news impartially, without fear or favor, and it was to be a paper of record providing all the news that's fit to print. Thus was born what became known as the objectivity standard, which was soon adopted as the core ethical norm by the American Society of Newspaper Editors and by the Society of Professional Journalists before quickly diffusing overseas. Objectivity never meant political neutrality. Publishers such as Ox, Hearst, Northcliffe, Beaverbrook had very strong views and wanted to advocate them. But what objectivity did mean was attempting to draw a line, one sharper than could ever be drawn in reality, between the reporting of facts and the analysis and evaluation of those facts. This partly involved a change in substance. The task of reporters and the content of news reports was narrowed to the collection and recording of the four W's and one H, as they were known. Who, what, when, where, and how, with why, the why question being left to others. At the same time, the shape of newspapers changed. Uh, um, analysis, opinion, and editorials were segregated physically from ordinary reporting and given separately identified pages of their own. Until then, the distinction between reporters, correspondents, and columnists was blurred. Now, a sharp distinction was drawn including in terms of where they appeared in the paper between reporters and correspondents who reported facts and columnists who stated a point of view. And this gave the writing of opinion a visibility and a prestige it had never previously enjoyed. At least in principle, this was a happy coincidence of theory and practice. In terms of theory, the Kantian legacy stressed the role of the press in supporting the rational formation of public opinion through objective civil presentation of facts and analyses. And in terms of practice, the commercial incentives faced by publishers pushed them to adopt that role as their lodestar. Moreover, for all the slips between the ideal and reality, it would be fair to say that this unexpected coming together of commerce and philosophy seemed to deliver the goods. It is, in effect, a humbling experience for a mere columnist today to reread the great columnists of the period from the end of the Second World War to the closing years of the 1970s when this model was at its height. It is not merely a question of English language writers such as Walter Lippmann and the Alsop brothers in the United States or George Orwell in Britain. Even in continental Europe, the leading daily papers carried columns by the likes of Albert Camus Raymond Daron in France, Noberto Bobbio, Nicola Cremonte, and Indro Montanelli in Italy, all of whom wrote week after week with style, verve, and erudition. Set against the great sweep of history, it is hard to think of another period when such depth of insight and civility of tone were brought to large numbers of readers, helping to create the expectation that this was how what Hobbes termed the conversation of mankind was to be conducted. None of these writers confused civility with the refusal to take a point of view, even one that was strongly partisan. Their sense of moderation was anything but in philosophie pour les âmes tendres, a philosophy for tender souls, as Jean-Paul Sartre dismissively called it. Thus, reflecting towards the end of his life on his intellectual career, Raymond Daron, a man of the center-right who, unlike Sartre, had been among the first to join the French resistance, wrote that, quote, the liberalism in which I sought and found my spiritual home has nothing in common with a philosophy for tender souls. Rather, it demands of the writer a good dose of courage to swim against the current and to draw as clearly and explicitly as possible 
the lessons, however uncertain, of historical experience. Equally, Norberto Bobbio, a man of the left who was also active in the resistance to Mussolini and Hitler, defined his style as one that combined frankness and directness with what he called mitizza, which in Italian means mildness, to term the virtue involved in refusing submissiveness without falling into arrogance. There is, in that sense, great truth in Alan Wolfe's recent reappraisal of the development of American political culture, where he refers to the first decades after the end of the Second World War as a time when the dominant values in the public conversation were political maturity and the sense of historical irony. Perhaps no one expressed those values better than the literary critic Lionel Trilling when he asserted that after the horrors of the war and the Holocaust, there was on each and every participant in the public conversation a moral obligation to be intelligent. None of that is said in the spirit of what would be misplaced nostalgia. But Hannah Arendt was right when she wrote, echoing the lines in The Tempest, that we should relate to the past not in order to resuscitate it, which is clearly impossible, but, she said, like a pearl diver who descends to the bottom of the sea to retrieve lost treasures that, having undergone a sea change, lie there awaiting the intrepid soul who will bring them up into the world of the living. Viewed from today's perspective, the spirit of that age seems like a treasure indeed, lying lost from view full fathom five. Yet however dazzling that lost treasure may seem, it also had its stern critics. Writing in a neo-Marxist tradition, the scholars of the Frankfurt School, Max Horkheimer, Theodore Dorno, Herbert Marcuse, and at least in his early years, Jürgen Habermas, cast the media with its highly concentrated ownership as pacifying, manipulating, and distorting public opinion, narrowing the range of controversy and creating a consensus that was as contrived and repressive in fact as it was tolerant and open-minded in theory. Only slightly later, commentators on the right also lambasted the media, claiming that the few communications channels it offered, including the leading newspapers, had been captured by what Americans called liberals, who were using their control to spread leftist propaganda. It would be easy to show that the critics on both the left and the right shared a greatly exaggerated sense of the media's importance. They held what might be termed the hyperdermic needle view of media influence. Whatever the media said was injected, as if by a hyperdermic needle, into the mind of the recipient, altering his or her opinions. However, already in the late 1940s, research undertaken at Columbia by the Austrian-born sociologist Paul Lazarfeld had cast doubt on whether the media had anywhere near as much impact on opinion formation as the media itself thought and as the hypodermic needle model implied. And subsequent work, filling many, many volumes of statistical journals, has only strengthened that skepticism. Nonetheless, it would be wrong to dismiss the critics entirely. There is, after all, no doubt that media ownership was highly concentrated reflecting the economies of scale involved in assembling mass audiences and delivering them to advertisers. There is equally no doubt that as C. Wright Mills claimed in his enormously influential book, The Power Elite, the media did not provide public communications. It supplied mass communications. The crucial difference between these, as he articulated the concepts, being that while public communications allowed for give and take, mass communications involved narrow channels that operated in one direction only. Far fewer people expressed opinions than received them, and the recipients had no scope to answer back immediately or with any effect. And it is undeniable that the political culture on which this system rested was elitist. Indeed, elitism had permeated the model of public deliberation from the outset. In effect, its core concept of public opinion always beg the question, who is the public? Or to put it slightly differently, whose opinion matters and who doesn't? None of the thinkers who shaped the theory of public deliberation 
conceived of the public in especially inclusive terms. Kant had wanted to restrict participation in the public debate to property owners. As for Rousseau, he rigorously distinguished the general will, which should determine the laws, from the mere will of all, devising mechanisms which limited when they did not prohibit free association and which severely restricted debate. By the middle of the 19th century, those narrow views of the scope of the deliberative public had, if anything, hardened. The French Revolution, with its descent into the terror, played a crucial role in that respect. In the Revolution, the Kantian public had met its antithesis, not the autocratic monarch, but the mob, in whose madness, horrors, and crimes, Carlyle saw what he called the crowning phenomenon of modern time. Behind the rioter, he said, lay the savage. Little wonder, then, that Tocqueville, perhaps the most democratic of the century's liberals, opposed every extension of the franchise that was proposed during his period as a parliamentarian. John Stuart Mill, for his part, saw little merit in public opinion and advocated that political questions be decided not by an appeal to the insight of an uninformed multitude, but only by appeal to the views formed after due consideration of the relatively small number of people specially educated for this task. <coughs> Finally, Bajot took it as obvious that any workable democracy required inducing, quote, the self-satisfied stupid mass of humanity to admit its own insufficiency, unquote. But whatever the philosophers may have thought, ultimately, it was the technology which determined who had access to communications channels. And if it did nothing else, the rise of the internet democratized access as thoroughly as the most radical of Democrats might have wanted. The mass communications, C. Wright Mills pilloried, in which only the few can communicate to the many, was dead. The age of what C. Wright Mills called public communications, in which it is the many who are firmly in control, had arrived. The dawn of that era was, in its own way, an old dream of the utopians. For example, in his wildly popular Looking Backwards, which was published in 1888, Edward Bellamy imagined that by the year 2000, and he said by the year 2000, a quote-unquote technological web would not only allow people to hear the finest music and lectures in their home, but also to find, merely by tuning a few knobs, some that closely match their interests. This marvel, he hinted, might even permit many different voices to be heard, inaugurating the happy marriage of democracy and communications. And a marvel the internet indeed is. But while the benefits it has brought are beyond doubt, it is equally clear that its rise has left the newspaper industry reeling while redefining political cultures worldwide. Many economic models, in some cases of great technical sophistication, have been developed to analyze how the newspaper industry might react to the shocks it is experiencing. But those models are inevitably very sensitive to the assumptions on which they rest and can yield many different outcomes when the assumptions are modified. That is not a failing of the models. It is a sign of the fundamental indeterminacy of the reality in which the industry now operates. There are nonetheless reasons to believe that there remains a substantial demand for a quality press which differentiates its product by scrupulous attentions to facts, probing investigative reporting, and careful curating of the structure and presentation of the paper as a whole. As many mastheads around the world claw their way back from the precipice, it is becoming clearer that the newspaper, that symbol of modernity, will not disappear from the earth. But as heartening as that is, there are also reasons to believe that the mature, measured analysis which characterized newspapers in the age of the Alsop brothers is seriously threatened. Indeed, it was in grave peril even before the internet arrived. As Matthew Pressman has brilliantly shown, competition from news magazines, such as Time and Newsweek, and from television, led American newspapers to abandon the fact analysis distinction by the late 1970s. At the same time, their political positioning became much more pronounced. 
Now that trend has become nearly universal, as newspapers seek readers who are sufficiently interested in news and current affairs to pay for access. And for better or worse, most of those readers hold firmly defined views. In and of itself, the trend to greater political polarization among newspapers might cause little concern. After all, the mere fact that Camus wrote for newspapers that were clearly on the center left and Aron for newspapers that were clearly on the center right did not undermine the depth of their insight or the civility of their writing. However, looking across the advanced democracies as a whole, there is little doubt that the tone of commentary and of opinion has become increasingly shrill, posing a challenge to what remains of the communicative ideal. In part, the shrillness is just a response to the features of the online environment. To begin with, consumers are drowning in an incessant flow of competing content. On an admittedly rough calculation for 2005, finds that for every minute of mediated, news-related content consumed, there were a thousand minutes on offer. But that was before Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram brought the real torrents of content to bear. To be heard above the roar, one must be loud and piercing, and the pressure on publishers to generate hits, retweets, Facebook likes, and the other indicators that determine advertising revenues puts a premium on extreme views simply presented. The rise of anonymous comments as the primary form of online interaction has, in my view, aggravated the problems. It is, as the Talmudic sages remind us, no accident that in Genesis, Adam and Eve acquire names only after the fall. To have a name is to be responsible for one's words and deeds and hence for the good and evil one's actions cause. Nor is it an accident that for the ancients, the public sphere was where one acted in the open and hence could be named and held accountable, as against the private sphere where one acted in the secrecy afforded by the walls of one's own home. Unburdened by that obligation of taking responsibility Anonymous commentary, though sometimes well worthwhile, is too often mere abuse that has pushed the deterioration in the public discourse a step further. But the Internet's features are not the whole story. Rather, it is important to also consider the changing composition of the public that newspapers address. There is in that an element of irony. If the thinkers who highlighted the deliberative role of the public sphere were elitist, it was not because they believed in their own inherent superiority. It was because education was only available to the very few. They therefore looked forward to an era in which mass education would lay the foundation for universal participation in reasoned, civil, informed discussion. At least as far as newspapers are concerned, that era has surely arrived. The newspaper reading public has more years of education than ever before. As late as 1966, 48% of readers of the New York Times had never attended college. By 2016, virtually all had at least a four-year college degree. The exceptions, presumably, being Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, who are probably wealthier than all the other readers put together. Yet it is these highly educated readers who seem to demand the polarized, dogmatic, petulant expressions of opinion that have become widespread, at least in the United States. The elite, it might be said, have become the mob our intellectual ancestors so seriously and anxiously feared. There is a rich vein of observers who believe that reflects a deterioration in individual character. At least since Tocqueville, Max Weber, and Freud, analysts have forged the link between personality and social context. Beginning with Christopher Lash's 1979 bestseller, The Culture of Narcissism, which denounced what Lash called the illiteracy of the highly educated, writers in that tradition have seen 
narcissism, particularly secondary narcissism, that is the narcissism that reduces the world to love and hate, as the dominant personality trait of our era. Incapable of overcoming the wounds of prolonged childhood, narcissists lack the strength required to become independent, free-thinking individuals, says Elie Zaretsky, and hence cannot be, quote, rational, co-equal participants in creating the binding forces and resisting the destructive forces of civilization. In fact, instead, they vent their passions and frustrations, fluctuating between adoration and fury. While that is not implausible, how broadly it holds is difficult to say. And it's not clear, at least to me, how it might be tested. But what has been tested and shown, notably by the American political scientist Alan Abramovitz, is that highly educated voters are different. They are not only more politically polarized than less educated voters, but also tend to have a lower tolerance for cognitive dissonance. Quite unlike less educated voters, they hold their views as a tightly bound and coherent package, rationalizing away all discordant facts and observations and never admitting of concessions to the other side. Rather than the open-minded citizens John Stuart Mill had confidently expected universal education to produce, it may have created a public whose salient feature is its unwavering and unquestioning commitment to a fixed point of view. In short, commentary is buffeted by three forces at once. The supply side pressure on publishers to obtain the internet hits that are advertisers core metric, the demand side pressure from readers who are time starved and politically polarized, and the quality destroying features of the internet. Trapped, trapped in the crossfire, civility risks becoming a distant memory. Or perhaps not. We are, it might fairly be said, moral hypochondriacs, always worried that the thin veneer of civility which holds societies together is on the verge of collapse. There are good grounds for that constant anxiety, as Norbert Elias, the great scholar of civility and of its history, emphasized on the basis of his direct experience of Nazi Germany, it takes centuries to go from barbarism to civility, minutes to go the other way. The hypochondria, deeply ingrained by millennia of natural selection, may help ensure that when such dangers loom, we change course. But it is only if we understand what is imperiled and why it matters that such a change of course will be possible. In my view, the ideal of a community which takes political decisions through rational deliberation retains all of its validity. So does the need for it to be informed by thoughtful civil commentary, which helps each and every person fulfill the definition Kant gave 230 years ago when he asked the question, what is enlightenment? Enlightenment, he answered, is sapere audo, dare to know. Dare to know, have the courage to know. That is, I believe, the essence of the civilization we have inherited. When the learning is long forgotten, it remains for each of us the jewel whose glow can illuminate an otherwise dark future. In thanking all of you for your patience, I'm confident that thanks to the efforts of the Ramsey Center, the moral integrity of my fellow columnists, and the commitment of all of you, we will be able to say, like John Hooker, the great 16th century Anglican defender of faith and reason, posterity shall know, whatever happens, that we have not loosely through silence permitted these great things to pass away. Thank you very much. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to invite um, our two discussants up to the stage uh, to, to sit up here and uh, Henry I think you've got to have a mic attached to you before you join them so perhaps Paul and James you'd like to come up here.
In fact, um, Paul and James probably need very little introduction, especially to this audience. Paul Kelly is one of our most distinguished journalists. Uh, he has covered, as you all know, Australian politics from the era of Gough Whitlam to the era of Scott Morrison uh, at the highest level. He is editor-at-large on The Australian, where he was previously editor-in-chief. He writes on Australian politics, on public policy, and on international affairs. He is a regular television commentator on Sky News. He is the author of nine books, including perhaps most famously The End of Certainty <clears throat> on the politics and economics of the 1980s. Uh, his recent books include Triumph and Demise on the Rudd-Gillard era and The March of Patriots, which offers a reinterpretation of Paul Keating and John Howard in office. I'll also introduce uh, James Chessel, one of Australia's very best business journalists. James began his career as a cadet at The Age and has worked at the country's best known mastheads, including the Sydney Morning Herald, The Australian and The Australian Financial Review in a number of reporting and editing roles, including recently as the Europe correspondent for The Financial Review. James has won the City Journalism Award for Excellence and the Walkley Award. Uh, and uh, as, as the recently appointed Group Executive Editor of Australian Metro Publishing, that means he is the editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, The Brisbane Times and The Canberra Times. So these are our two discussants and I'm going to ask each of them, once they're mic'd up, to speak for about five minutes, after which Henry will rejoin them on the stage and then the floor will be open for comment and questions from all of us. Paul Kelly. <coughs> Simon Haynes, John Howard, Henry Ergas, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege to respond to Henry's paper. It's an extraordinary paper comprehensive, historic, philosophical, and yet practical. Henry has enlightened us on many points. Uh, my own view in shorthand terms is that reasoned debate and sensible opinion is under threat, but I'm an optimist. I believe that it will survive um, uh, despite the new platforms which will dominate the media. In my brief five minutes, let me make a few points. First, the quality of civilised discussion and its temper always reflects the condition of society and culture. Today, that condition is in traumatic discord. As the Ramsey Centre knows only too well, our society has lost its shared agreement on many fundamentals. We disagree on marriage, on how to raise children, on the purpose of education, on how to die, on free speech, on the identity of human beings, on religious freedom, and on what constitutes virtue. We disagree on what to be a civilised society involves. It's unsurprising, therefore, that uh, the nature of opinion pieces and the nature of debate is being called into question. We are losing the means of having a civilised discourse. But this takes us into other areas, one cultural, one technological. The first is the cult of individual rights or individual narcissism now ingrained in our society. Individuals seek self-fulfilment in their personal creeds. As Henry said, the more educated people are, the more they seem to insist on their own credo. We are less prepared to make concessions, less prepared to accept an alternative opinion in good faith. The decline of religion seems to have driven a new morality based on rising intolerance. The related point is the poisoning of civilised discourse through technology. The rise of social media, the internet, Facebook, uh, 
and its future variations empowers each individual's domain. The individual is a news consumer, but also a news producer. That's a technological revolution and points to a social revolution as well. This is one of the enduring departures from the industrialised age. And newspapers are one of the great inventions of the industrialised age. Newspapers, as Henry said, found a brilliant concord between a big circulating product, a product that informed, provided news and created emotional ties, and a product that through advertising became highly profitable. Newspapers were fundamental in shaping the culture of the industrialised age. They were one of its great products, one of the most enormous influences of that, of that age which ran for a couple of centuries. It was an age of mass loyalty to institutions. It was an age of collective power, loyalty to the company, the union, the political party, the class, the nation. Newspapers not only shaped these loyalties, but they helped to define the lines of political division between capital and labour, between various political parties. Newspapers were rarely impartial. The great media barons and their causes, represented in Australia by uh, the Packer, Fairfax and Murdoch families, among others, uh, influenced uh, debate, influenced opinion. They particularly influenced page one. We shouldn't forget uh, the importance and role of page one. Certainly I never have. Um, the attitude was often the opinion pages are fine, but the front page is what counts. Opinion pages and opinion columnists came late to Australia. The op-ed page on the Australian newspaper for example, was created by Frank Devine when he was editor-in-chief of the paper in the 1980s and it drew upon his experience in the United States. Our papers before that, such as The Australian, had regular daily feature pages with some political commentary, but not op-ed pages as such. After the 1980s, we developed an op-ed page as well as a feature page, and that's still what happens in The Australian today. The watershed change at Fairfax came at the age, under Graham Perkin in the 1970s, influenced very much by Adrian Demas, Australian, and then at the Broadway headquarters at the end of the 1970s and early 1980s, under James Fairfax's chairman, when a troika ran the company, uh, Fred Brinchley as general manager, uh, Greg Gardner as financial manager, and Max Such as chief editorial executive, and Vic Carroll was appointed editor-in-chief of the Sydney Morning Herald, and then we saw the fantastic transformation of the Sydney Morning Herald from the old, grey, dull paper that it used to be. The nature of the op-ed page and the nature of the articles on the page is determined partly by the paper's character and traditions, and partly by whoever is the current editor-in-chief. It's the editor-in-chief, the senior editors, and the op-ed page editor that determines the style, the standards of the page, and critically, the criteria for selection. This is a serious power, and the power still exists. I had no trouble, as editor-in-chief of The Australian in the 1990s, in spiking columns that I felt were too emotional, or badly written, or badly argued, or advanced propositions that I felt were too marginal. I put a premium on, on ideas, particularly fresh ideas, and pieces that were well argued. Above all, pieces that were, per, were persuasive, articles that were interesting and attractive. There is no excuse or no rationalisation for dullness. In my view, newspapers in the internet age should uphold this mission. They should uphold their standards. Styles have changed, but quality is enduring. And I think there is a risk to the extent that newspapers, and of course newspapers are now appearing both in print and online, there is a risk that they might adjust too much to, to the demands of the internet age, and their opinion pieces might become too partisan, 
too shallow, too shrill. If that happens, then I think that will undermine the essential mission rather than be seen as a constructive adaption to technological change. In that sense, I think civilised reasoned argument should be maintained on the opinion pages. After all, they are the ownership of the paper and they are the ownership of the people who run and own the paper itself. The internet and social media is a different beast. It constitutes a challenge in many ways to the style, method and temper of traditional opinion pieces. We have to adjust to that, but we have to adjust to that without losing our own sense of integrity. It's true that we live in an age of rising populist political sentiment, aggravated ideological dispute. It's the age of Donald Trump and Brexit. And that means, of course, there will be increasing demand for opinion pieces to reflect a more partisan age. I think there's a role for that to a certain extent. I understand that there is an ideological war, a culture war, a battle going on between respective partisan political positions, and opinion pieces have got to be involved in that dispute, taking sides in that dispute. But it's also important to have opinion pieces that stand above it, that have an historical cynicism and a philosophical detachment and can write about the nature of the dispute and what it means for society. Columnists have a privileged position. They have a point of view. They might be progressive or conservative, they might be free market, they might be government interventionist. But they have a responsibility and those who publish the columnists have a responsibility. And it's this sense of mutual responsibility in the future which is going to be more important than ever. It's possible, as Henry said very well, to take a point of view as an opinion columnist, to make an argument and do that short of personal abuse and do that maintaining a civilised content and tone. So a final point to fi uh, some final points to finish on. We live in an age of emotion. That's the nature of social media. And to a certain extent, reason is under assault. We need to be aware of that, and we need to put a greater premium on reason while being alert to the power of emotion and work out how we respond to that. We need to be aware that we live in an age dominated by the voices of special interests, uh, sectional interests, uh, all sorts of uh, varied identity interests now in society. The sense of national interest is under assault. But of course, it's the responsibility of the government of the day and quality public policy to cater to the national interest. Here is where opinion is very important. Opinion has got to try and carry the banner for the national interest. At this time, when we have so many uh, diverse and disparate voices in society uh, uh, appealing for special interests. The point I made in a column in the Australian last Saturday about the debate about trust in our society is that we are losing trust and that's a problem. Trust is all important and the restoration of trust is important. Yet the debate about trust is also dominated by all sorts of special interests and special cultural causes. So essentially what we see, we see um, uh, these uh, particular issues before us now being hijacked and taken over by the special interests. Quality reasoned opinion is designed to counter and check that. So we've got to uphold the banner for persuasion. Persuasion is enormously important. There's no point beating an ideological drum if you are not persuasive. Insight is fundamental. An insight into the nature of our condition, to our problems, to our tribulations, and to solutions is absolutely fundamental. Insight is enormously important. Looking after historical memory. <clears throat> 
In the technological age, it's hard to remember what happened yesterday or last year, let alone what happened last decade. But the preservation of historical memory is fundamental. And finally, reason. The art and the power of reason must continue to prevail in the opinion pieces. As I said, the process is under threat, but I'm still confident enough to believe it will be maintained with a premium put on excellence. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, could I start by acknowledging uh, John Howard, the former Prime Minister, and also by thanking Simon Haynes for inviting me today. Uh, Simon has a very challenging job, to say the least. In, in my view, he is going about it with the right combination of energy, diplomacy and intellect. At the Sydney Morning Herald, we have made a point of covering the Ramsey Centre's attempt to establish a Western Civilisation course at University of Sydney as comprehensively as possible. I think it's a very important story which says a lot about how the contest of ideas is conducted these days. Um, to say it's a great pleasure to be up here with Henry and Paul would be a gross understatement. I'm going to lower the tone by quoting the movie Wayne's World by saying, I am definitely not worthy. Paul is the gold standard when it comes not just to political commentary and journalism, but also to newspaper editing. He's also not a bad author. Over the years when I've moved house, I've carefully packed my copy of The End of Certainty and taken it with me, and I dip into it uh, to this day. Henry is also a writer I admire greatly. Uh, it was my dad, who has a PhD in economics, who put me onto his columns uh, what feels like many years ago, and I've never stopped reading them since. Um, his speech or his talk tonight was absolutely fantastic. Um, so in the time uh, allotted to me, I thought I'd try to give a very quick and by the standards of what's come before, very rudimentary perspective on what I look at or look for from a colum col columnist as an editor and then address the three forces affecting opinion writing or commentary that Henry listed towards the end of his speech. Um, I'm going to try and be a little optimistic and I'm going to try and be a little contrarian. What I look for in a columnist doesn't always divide neatly along civilised and uncivilised lines. Um, indeed, some of my favourite commenters, columnists, aren't particularly civilised. In order to prepare for my remarks, I texted one of them, AFR Rear Window columnist Joe Aston, earlier this week to get his views on the subject of this evening. His response uh, was that the question, in his view, was a, mo a moot point. It's like trying to argue flowers can only be red or yellow, he said. What Joe is trying to say is that the readers of the Financial Review expect him to be unpredictable, opinionated, and at times arrogant. There's not a lot of the mildness Henry spoke about before in his writing. Meanwhile, however, Henry's readers, or Paul's readers, expect them to be civilised. And in newspapers, we talk about having the right mix, and I think that's very important. Both modes of commentary can be effective. Um, Joe Aston, for example, has had success exposing flaws in certain organisations, such as Cricket Australia, or CPA Australia, or even the Federal Liberal Party from time to time. His approach may be very different to that of Paul or Henry, but I would, I would argue it is still valid. But I don't want to come across as flippant. My North Star when it comes to these things is the late, great H.L. Mencken, who said, the more uncivilised the man, the, sure, the surer he is that he knows precisely what is right and what is wrong. The truly civilised man is always sceptical and tolerant in this field as in all others. This culture is based on, I am, sorry, his culture is based on, I am not too sure. And one of the things we talk about in the newsroom is removing shrillness from commentary. And shrill, the word shrill has been used by all three of us now, and I think it's a, a, a cancer on, on opinion writing um, and needs to be stamped out whenever possible. 
What all good columnists do is offer insight that goes beyond the hot takes that populate the internet and social media. If I'm reading Paul's work, I know he's spoken to the important people in Canberra. If I'm reading Henry's work on a Productivity Commission report, for example, I know he's not only read every word, he probably knows more about the subject than the author. And if I'm reading an excellent Stephen Bartholomew column in the Sydney Morning Herald, Stephen writes about the field of business, I know he regularly interacts with the top echelons of Australia's corporate community. None of these writers are captured by their contacts or their contexts, but you can't expect to cover subject matter properly without talking to the key people involved. The worst type of column is the one written by someone whose connection with the events they are describing appears to have been watching the, those events on television. Which brings me to the three forces that Henry mentioned uh, that affect in commentary in the modern media. The first was the si supply side pressures on publishers to get those hits and clicks to satisfy advertisers. While I agree hot takes, clickbait and other variants of mass online journalism have done little to enhance the standard of commentary, there is an alternative which is taking form in Australia and other parts of the world. Increasingly, newsrooms or quality newsrooms are moving to subscription-based economic models and away from relying on reach. In a world where subscriptions are important, a smaller number, by definition, a smaller number of readers, uh, loyal readers, are more valuable. For example, the Sydney Morning Herald has about five million monthly readers, which all contribute to a greater or lesser extent to digital ad dollars. However, a tiny fraction of that number, our paying subscribers, account for the, ma the majority of the masthead's economic value. And the good thing about that is loyal subscribers tend to value more considered civilised commentary. So if you're looking at Stephen Bartholomew's, Bartholomew's as an example, he doesn't have a huge reach, he doesn't get a lot of clicks, but he converts a lot of casual readers into subscribers, and for me as an editor, that is far more valuable. The second point Henry raised was the partisan and strident one, the issue that readers are becoming more polarised, and this is the one I grapple with most of all. One note of optimism I would sound on this is that we have found that explainers, which is a form of journalism where you try and explain what's going on in a very reasoned and considered way, are becoming incredibly popular and incredibly valued. If we measure engagement, and people read these things to the end. So I think there's a real hunger um, out there for journalism that explains things. And one of the, one of the key themes, it's very interesting when we, when we uh, test our readers and poll our readers and um, serve our, our readers is that they're worried about the future. Um, uh, they worry about what kind of jobs their children will have in the future. Um, they're worried about technology and automation and all sorts of things and the environment. Um, so journalism that tries to make sense of, the, of, this, of this world that people live in uh, tends to be valued. The third and final, uh, the third and final uh, issue raised by Henry um, as, it, as it affects commentary was the inherent features of the internet, and I'll probably pick on the anonymous commentary issue, which is, a, which is no doubt a scourge. Another little note of optimism on that would be the Financial Times, our counterpoint would be the Financial Times in, in the UK, which has made a virtue rather than a vice of its commentary. I agree that most commentary, a lot of the comments you'll see on the bottom of stories are the intellectual equivalent of a bin fire. However, the FT has championed the people that provide insightful and intelligent commentary. They publish them. They put them in stories, they do an end of year review on the best comments, and that's attracted, it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So more and more people are providing intelligent commentary, and it's part of the FT brand now. You go there because you know the commentary is actually worth reading. So while I don't disagree with, disagree with Henry's assertion that civility risks becoming a distant memory if we aren't kept too careful. For the reasons I have just outlined, I also think there is reason to be cautiously hopeful about the future. Thank you very much.